This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Skittles. Do you like disappointing trick-or-treaters? Try Skittles today. Welcome to episode 64 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. It is Friday, November 5th. You can subscribe to The Sweaty Penguin on Apple, Spotify, Google, Podcast Addict, wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to leave a five-star rating and a review, and you will get a shout-out at the end of the show. The other way to get a shout-out? Join our Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll also get access to some Sweaty Penguin swag, exclusive bonus content, and more. You can do that by heading over to patreon.com slash The Sweaty Penguin. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Pro. Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Today, we are talking about orangutans, the reason why a bizarre number of people on social media seem perfectly fine with fighting a chicken with their bare hands every time they get in the car. For anyone over the age of 23, there's a new meme where people asked, would you rather fight a chicken to the death every time you got in a car, or fight an orangutan to the death once a year but you got a sword? And shockingly, everyone seems to be saying chicken, which is ridiculous. One, one fight per year gives you a nice long break to recover between fights, but two, three times a day is a nuisance I don't think people are fully understanding here. Two, chickens are vicious. They have beaks and claws and can peck at you. And while I think most of us could win that fight, you're probably getting pretty wounded every time. And three, you have a sword. This shouldn't be difficult. Just take some fencing classes. Or better yet, stab randomly. It's a sword. To anyone who picked chicken over orangutan, please just take some time to reflect on your life choices. But even though we don't want to get caught in a fight with them, humans have a really special affinity for orangutans. And it's not surprising, right? People share 97% of their DNA with orangutans in comparison to 60% with chickens and bananas. That's actually true. You can look it up. I wouldn't have expected people are more like bananas than unlike bananas, but I guess that's why science is cool. Of course, when there's an animal in the wild that we have so much in common with, we'll want to help them out. Just listen to a snippet from this Smithsonian documentary about an orangutan school in Indonesia. The lessons taught here aren't in math or science, though. They're in survival. And the students are orphan orangutans. These youngsters should all still be living with their mothers. But as forests in Borneo are decimated and adult orangutans killed by plantation owners and poachers, this species is on the brink of extinction. Isn't that amazing? Orangutans get to spend their childhoods hating school too. I only hope for their sake that their standardized tests are less multiple choice and more open-ended. I mean, don't get me wrong, multiple choice is a little less stressful on the day sometimes, but it really requires more rote memorization, whereas open-ended really gives them the chance to be creative and use their writing skills, which I would assume orangutans much prefer. But the fact that these schools exist and have piqued enough interest that there's now a documentary about them is really something to think about. We care on such a personal level about this species. So our interest and our focus seems to be on helping these individual orphaned orangutans survive. That's important, of course. But when the reason they don't already know how to survive is because their mothers died largely due to forest loss and poaching, if we really do care about orangutans, it may make sense to look bigger picture at these issues and find solutions which could help the entire species and the whole ecosystem around them. 
Training baby orangutans to survive in the wild obviously doesn't work if there isn't a forest for them to go back to. There are even experts who suggest these sorts of conservation efforts lead orangutans to not want to go back to the wild, since they enjoy the food, shelter, and social interaction provided by human caretakers. I mean, why go back to climbing flimsy tree branches when you can climb sturdy metal bars? So as cool as these schools are to help out these individuals and express our care, I want to be careful. The goal probably shouldn't be putting every orangutan in school, but making sure they have an environment where they and their mothers can survive. So that's what we're going to explore today. What issues are facing orangutans, what that means at an ecosystem level, and how we could try to improve the situation moving forward. But first, a little about orangutans. Orangutans are great apes native to the rainforests of Indonesia and Malaysia. There are three species of orangutan, one living on the island of Borneo, which is shared by Indonesia, Malaysia, and Brunei, one living in the northern part of the Indonesian island of Sumatra, and one very small and recently discovered distinct population in the South Tapanuli region of Sumatra. It's worth noting that throughout history, orangutans could be found all throughout Southeast Asia, even into Southern China. But today, they're just confined to the forests of these two islands. We like to think orangutans are important because they look like people. Well, they look like dads at a public pool. But orangutans are in fact a keystone species, a species that ecosystems are highly dependent on and would drastically change without. Largely, that's due to the orangutan's ability to disperse seeds. Orangutans have a fun diet, consisting of leaves, bark, flowers, honey, insects, vines, and shoots of plants, but their primary food source is fruit. And when they eat a durian, for example, one of their favorite fruits, they discard the skin, eat the flesh, and spit out the seeds. Perhaps that's considered rude at a dinner table unless you're five, but in nature, that returns the durian seeds to the environment and allows new durian trees to grow. They provide this seed dispersal service for a number of rainforest species, which is why they're considered to be so important to their ecosystems. In fact, the name orangutan actually means man of the forest in the Malay language. According to National Geographic emerging explorer Panut Hadisiswoyo, this role of the orangutan is really meaningful. And I would say that the orangutan is actually the guardian of the forest because they actually keep regenerating, you know. They keep planting trees. They are the best gardener of the forest. And that means actually they are the symbol of our fight against global warming. A guardian, a gardener, a symbol of our fight against global warming. That's high praise to live up to, orangutans. Beat that, impossible whoppers. But Panut's argument that orangutans are this important not just to their forests, but to the climate of the entire planet, makes it all the more concerning, then, that orangutans are endangered. In Sumatra, they're critically endangered, according to the World Wildlife Fund. The WWF estimates that today there are 104,700 Bornean orangutans, 13,846 Sumatran orangutans, and just 800 Tapanuli orangutans, making the Tapanuli orangutan the most endangered of all great apes. I know some of us love animals, and it's sad just knowing a species is endangered. Hearing the possibility of losing an animal you once saw at the zoo or on Animal Planet or in your picture books as a kid. But orangutans go beyond that. They're the gardeners of the forest. And by planting trees through seed dispersal, they're the symbol of our fight against global warming. Well, them and Annie's vegan mac and cheese. So why are orangutans threatened? Well, there's several reasons, and let's start with climate change. First off, if you remember back to our monsoons episode, Borneo and Sumatra are in a monsoon region. They experience a wet season and a dry season. And with climate change, the dry season is becoming drier, leaving the regions prone to wildfires. 
We know wildfires can have a profound effect on orangutans. In the Indonesian portion of Borneo, which is called Kalimantan, there were major fires from 1997 to 1998, and a survey from Biological Conservation in 2003 showed the wild orangutan population in the Sibangau area of central Kalimantan had decreased by 49% after the fires. Not only were the fires themselves dangerous, but hundreds of fleeing orangutans were killed by villagers as they left the forests and searched for food. See, orangutans, this is why you need to stop, drop, and roll. Seriously, did they teach you anything in orangutan school? With climate change leading to worse droughts and heightened wildfire risks, the chance of this type of disaster certainly goes up. Beyond wildfires, climate change affects rainfall patterns and temperature, which can also affect their ability to find food. Fruit, leaves, and all their other food sources rely on certain weather patterns to grow, and if it's too hot, too cold, too wet, or too dry, their food availability could go down. That doesn't necessarily mean orangutans will immediately all starve, but it could lead orangutans to roam into villages in search of food and get killed by humans, or it could lead them to reproduce less. According to conservation.org, orangutans are less likely to reproduce when food is scarce. Who knew hunger and bad weather aren't aphrodisiacs? Those are some of the more direct impacts of climate change, but perhaps more notable is an indirect link human-induced forest loss. Cutting down trees affects orangutans and affects the climate at the same time by releasing the carbon dioxide that the forest had previously been storing. That's right, it's a two-for-one deal. With Groupon, you can buy climate change and get endangered orangutans free. This forest loss takes two forms, deforestation and fragmentation. Deforestation refers to just the mass decimation of forest, as International Animal Rescue's CEO Alan Knight describes. Unfortunately, this is the uh, scene that I see when I go to work in Ketapang in West Kalimantan in Borneo. Uh, the forest has just been destroyed. Massive, massive areas have been destroyed, which is uh, horrible to see. And when the photographer that took this, a friend of mine called Gavin, actually uh, looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, it's, it's like a First World War battle scene something like Passchendaele, and it is like that. It's impossible for me to show you a picture of a Borneo forest via podcast, unfortunately, but when you hear the comparison to a World War I battle scene, you should have a pretty good idea that there's a problem. Orangutans, of course, require the forest to survive for water, food, nests, everything. So when you hear that the forest is decimated to this degree, you can understand why that would be bad for orangutans. A World War I battle scene is certainly not a habitat where orangutans can thrive. Why are we cutting all these trees down? Are a bunch of real-life Minecraft players trying to entertain themselves? Are they doing a live-action remake of the Lorax? As it turns out, it's actually largely due to palm oil. With fertile soil and flat topography, this land is perfectly suited for palm oil plantations. In fact, in Malaysian and Indonesian Borneo, around 6.5 million hectares of lowland forest had been converted to palm oil by 2010. And that number is only growing because we use palm oil in a lot of stuff. It's a biofuel, it's a very common food additive, and it's in a ton of personal care and cleaning products. In shampoos and soaps, palm oil is almost always the foaming agent. The entirety of the palm oil issue is worthy of a whole other episode of its own, so I won't cover it all here. But as an important resource that is almost entirely cultivated in this region of the world, palm oil presents a major issue for orangutans, for the Bornean and Sumatran forests at large, and of course, the climate. The other forest loss concern is fragmentation. While deforestation refers to these wide-scale clearings, fragmentation would be small things, like building a road through a forest that sort of breaks up the ecosystem into smaller ones. For orangutans, that poses a threat too. When orangutans build their nests, they're looking for tall, dense trees so they can hide from predators, and enough forest around the trees for them to have all the resources they need. If there's a road in the middle of the forest, orangutans won't want to be anywhere near it, and they certainly won't be crossing it on a regular basis. That's just the chickens. 
Not only does this affect orangutans psychologically and behaviorally, but it heavily condenses the range of each individual orangutan, meaning less seed dispersal and less genetic diversity. And we know inbreeding made the Habsburgs look like orangutans. Now imagine what inbred orangutans would look like. And if that wasn't enough for orangutans to deal with, humans are actually out killing orangutans themselves. This is really infuriating, I know, but there's some nuance here, so bear with me. The authors of a study in the journal PLOS1 actually went to Kalimantan and interviewed over 5,000 people in over 450 villages. Of the respondents who had killed an orangutan, 56% killed the orangutan in order to eat it. Obviously, hunting an endangered species isn't great, but as far as motives go, needing food is a solid answer. It's not like there's a Burger King in the middle of the rainforest, you know, just a rainforest cafe. The next most common reasons were self-defense and crop raiding. And again, I think we can sympathize a little bit. I mean, those people are the smart ones for not choosing to kill a chicken every time they get in the car. In all seriousness, though, I get why an orangutan showing up in your village is scary, especially if it raids your crop and destroys your source of income. That said, according to Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program's Ian Singleton, we should also have some sympathy for the orangutan. There was a few farmers there, local guys with their guns. They decided it would be fun to shoot him. He's blind. He's got, still got two pellets in one eye and one in the other. He can't see anything. The plantations will say, oh, orangutans come out of the forest to eat our palm oil seedlings, but they'll eat palm oil seedlings in the same way that a shipwrecked mariner will eat his shoes or his belt. You know, it's not food. It's just the only thing there that they can try and survive with. And that's a fair point. The orangutan is just trying to survive. It's not malicious or anything. If people are finding joy in shooting orangutans in the eyes, that's just horrific. I would be curious to hear the side of the farmers, though, because they do have to protect their crop. I'm sure there's a middle ground here where farmers could deter orangutans without killing them, so Ian could be right that there's some foul play here, but I don't think we can quite take this kind of statement from conservationists at face value. Sort of like the food scenario. It's worth not demonizing people, but actually understanding their needs and considering if and how they can live harmoniously with orangutans. In this case, when it's forest loss and climate change driving orangutans into villages and scaring people, maybe it's unfair to place all the blame on the person who felt like they were acting in defense. Where this poaching does start to get a lot more frustrating, though, is A, people who poach orangutans to sell the meat, and B, people who kill mother orangutans in order to kidnap the infants and sell them in the illegal pet trade. Infant orangutans can be sold on the black market for up to $55,000 to people who want to keep them as illegal pets, largely wealthy people in China, Indonesia, and Thailand. But to any fans of Marcel the monkey from Friends, there's a reason some pets are illegal. For orangutans, they're endangered, and taking them out of the wild prevents them from dispersing seeds and reproducing. The poachers also kill the mothers for the sole purpose of capturing the baby for the pet trade. And worse, many of these infant orangutans die during transportation. As a result, it is estimated that for every pet orangutan, one to six adult orangutans were killed. Those are absolutely horrific numbers, and while it's not the primary cause of orangutan fatalities, it's absolutely worth finding a way to rein in. Keep in mind, fragmentation also allows poachers to navigate forests a lot more easily, so all of this starts to tie together. Now, save the orangutan is one of the most common refrains in the world of endangered species, and there's a lot of work being done to do that, so I have to take that as a good sign. People care. They're working on it. But in many cases, these efforts aren't zooming out to see the big picture. For example, a solution I saw all over the internet was to stop using palm oil, find other products. And if you don't want to support an industry responsible for a large amount of deforestation in this region of the world, by all means, you can make that choice. Maybe you'll even go TikTok viral for it. But based on our initial palm oil research, it seems more complicated than that. 
One, millions of smallholder farmers depend on palm oil for their livelihoods, and we probably don't want to put all of them out of work. Two, palm oil is somehow in everything, and you might not even know a product contains it because it has like a hundred different names, including palmate, glycerol stearate, and my personal favorite, Alasis guineensis, which sounds more like what Julius Caesar would name his kid than an ingredient. And three, palm oil is an incredibly efficient crop. It produces more oil per land area than any other equivalent vegetable oil crop. To get the same amount of oil out of soybeans, coconuts, or sunflowers, you would need four to ten times more land, which would just shift the problem to other parts of the world and possibly create even worse outcomes, not the least of which being more infomercials talking about how great coconut oil is. I get it. You drank a gallon of coconut oil, and you've suddenly lost 20 pounds, got a promotion, and became Batman, but I'm still not interested. So yes... Improving the palm oil industry would be huge for orangutans, but destroying the palm oil industry has a lot of drawbacks. There's ways governments could intervene to improve the industry, or private certifications could do the trick, where consumers can choose when they purchase products if their palm oil was grown sustainably. Again, this isn't a palm oil episode, so I won't get into detail, but I wanted to briefly discuss it since it does come up so much in the conversation about orangutans. But it's not just palm oil. If a solution is too laser-focused on saving the orangutans, it could very easily miss the fact that there's an entire forest ecosystem, an entire global climate, and many, many communities of people facing hardships of their own in the rainforests of Borneo and Sumatra for whom orangutans are probably not a high priority. For one, there's smallholder farmers, who if anything, I'm sure would consider orangutans a nuisance. Being told by out-of-towners to be nice to an animal that routinely puts their livelihoods in danger would get pretty annoying pretty fast, unless, of course, you had Beavis and Butthead tell them. I feel like in that case, the double annoying would cancel itself out. There are also indigenous tribes in these forests facing some major challenges. Listen to Peng Magut, a member of one of the last indigenous hunter-gatherer tribes on Earth in Borneo called the Penan, share what he is currently dealing with. Timber companies want their land at all costs. They have already offered Peng Magut money, motorcycles, and a car. These legs are my car. I don't need any of this. The forest is a bank created by God. I'm not interested in your money. The forest provides us with everything we need. I live here with my children, my grandchildren, my people. Just go away. I don't want you here. That's what I told them. Just go away. I don't want you here. Above all else, it seems, Peng Megut just wants to be left alone. And honestly, he has every right to feel that way. They live there. It's their land. If a timber company or palm oil company or what have you can't make an offer that they'll take, then they clearly value the land more. That's Economics 101. Now, I don't know whether orangutan conservationists would be welcomed with open arms or treated similarly, but based on this clip, it seems like this community doesn't want to be told how to live their life and has more important stuff to worry about. Obviously, if orangutans went extinct and the ecosystem crumbled, that's another story, but right now, they're in a battle to keep their land. And since these indigenous communities have no intention of chopping down the whole forest, it's probably in the best interest of orangutans to actually support them in their efforts, rather than come up with some plan that's completely orangutan-centric and doesn't include their input. So we need a rebrand. Instead of saying, save the orangutan, I guess we need to just start saying, meta. Yeah, that works. But what would that next step be, from orangutan-centric solutions to big-picture solutions? Well, we've talked about many options on the podcast before. On the climate front, it's all about decarbonizing, and of course not chopping down forests. And I'm sure better wildfire management would be a discussion relevant to orangutans. On the forest loss front, I don't know what the answer is. But it could be creating protected areas, it could be something like the UN's Red Plus program which grants countries financial incentives to keep forests intact, it could be implementing more sustainable palm oil practices. Of course, lots to consider there. 
On the poaching front, obviously the fact that we're calling it poaching means it's already illegal, but maybe there's some potential to think outside the box there. It seems like fixing the climate change and forest loss issues are prerequisites for reducing orangutan killings when they leave the forest and enter villages, but as for meat or the pet trade, could some market-based solution transform those into actual industries? I don't know what that would look like, but think about it. If someone is willing to spend $55,000 for a pet orangutan, think of how many orangutans would be saved with that money. Maybe people would be willing to spend even more money with the knowledge that it will go toward conservation. As you probably know from episodes we've done on succulents and sea turtles, I think poaching is a really intriguing case for outside-the-box solutions, and the orangutan example is certainly no different. Look, obviously none of this is easy, especially when we stop talking about fun orangutan schools and start talking about these larger and scarier underlying problems. But ultimately, if we can improve these issues, orangutans could become stable and self-sufficient once and for all, and I think that's ultimately a good goal to have. And hopefully in doing that, we can help these important rainforests, support the indigenous tribes and farmers in the region, and be sure the only reason the orangutan crosses the road is to escape all the cars full of attacking chickens. Do you wish Starburst were worse? Then Skittles are for you. Scientists say Skittles contain titanium dioxide, a food additive that regulators now say are unsafe for human consumption. But hey, what did you expect when they tried to make fruit-flavored M&Ms? No carcinogens? Skittles, the perfect way to say you hate kids without giving them all your tissues and pencils. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Liana Chua, the Tunku Abdul Rahman Lecturer in Malay World Studies at the University of Cambridge. Dr. Chua, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. First off, you published a paper a couple of years ago using orangutans as a case study for what you suggest are larger conservation issues, where interactions between the conservation world and the social science world are fraught. So what was this research about and what did you find? One of the first things that came to mind as we were starting this this research was that there just wasn't that much communication between orangutan conservation scientists and practitioners and people like social anthropologists who'd worked with the very villages and communities that they were trying to engage through their social programs and who could potentially provide all sorts of interesting and useful insights into the kinds of work that conservationists were doing. And so one of the big things we did in 2018 as part of this European Research Council funded project that I'm leading was that we decided to convene a workshop that would actually pull both orangutan conservation scientists and strategists into the same room as a bunch of social anthropologists and some of the social scientists, most of whom had worked on Borneo and various other parts of the region. So basically, it had worked on social and political issues that were very relevant to orangutan conservation on the ground. And what we essentially did here was put two groups that would not otherwise have been talking very much to each other around the same table and said, like, right, okay, we've got a day, let's talk. Let's actually just sit down and talk to each other and actually engage with each other as professionals and, and mutuals. And it was a really interesting experience. Many um, conservation scientists mentioned that they'd never actually had an experience like that before, probably the same with many social scientists. And one of them described this particular workshop as a kind of safe space in which we could actually just get together and talk through stuff as candidly as possible without the usual pressures of publicity, of you know research funding, all the things that in our, in our separate sectors and our separate fields, we tend to be very constrained by, which can also constrain our ability to reach out across disciplines and and sectors to talk to each other. And so um, following this workshop in which we identified a number of really quite key challenges that we faced in trying to understand the social dimensions um, of orangutan conservation, we decided, a number of us who had participated, decided to get together and try and co-write 
a journal article, just trying to sort of think through some of the issues that we talked about, and also to try and propose certain ways of moving forward in this particular relationship between conservation and the social sciences. And so the, the premise of the article was basically that we wanted to get past this kind of impasse in this relationship between conservation and the social sciences, which was that There was a tendency on the part of many conservationists to try and co-opt just social scientific methods and literature into existing conservation schemes without necessarily changing those conservation schemes and modes of thought, which wasn't necessarily very helpful. And on the other hand, there was a tendency, which I think is still prevalent in the social scientists, for social scientists to only critique conservationists for basically being jerks. Um, I, I could go into that later on. But, you know, essentially, there, there's been a very strong tendency in various sectors of the social sciences to just critique rather than to actually constructively engage and put forward useful suggestions. And it's interesting that conservationists and social scientists would have this impasse. It's interesting in part because it seems to me that the two sides would share the same goal. So, why wouldn't they be cooperating with each other? But I'm curious if you could shed some more light on why this disparity happened, how we got to this place, why we're even talking about needing to bring these people together. Yeah. Yeah. uh, I mean, it's an interesting point. So I think, first of all, it's probably worth saying that You know, I don't think anybody is trying consciously to antagonize the other party, right? I think the thing to point out here is that, um, you know, conservationists and social scientists actually tend to occupy quite different worlds. Um, I, I wouldn't say that most academic social scientists, for example, would call themselves part of the conservation world. There are many social anthropologists, for example, cultural anthropologists who work in Borneo and Sumatra, who just kind of move in a parallel universe to the sorts of biological anthropologists. So that's people who kind of study primates and um, DNA and and stuff like that. Um, They move in a parallel universe to the um, conservation scientists and the biological anthropologists who actually turn up to work in very similar spaces and areas in these same regions. And so I think a lot of it was just kind of there were very few channels available. There was very little interest in engaging beyond our respective fields. And so this sometimes led to, you know, what could then be uh, sort of mischaracterization of each other in various ways. And I think it's a very easy thing to do when you're not actually um, engaging in very much depth with each other across those fields. Now, having said that, I think it's also worth saying that there are various individuals that straddle that divide. There are, for example, um, social scientists who work with or for conservation organizations like um, Fauna and Flora and the WWF. And there are also conservation scientists who work within academia and engage with social scientists and other academics in various ways. So, you know, there's always this big sort of gray area in between. And I guess one of my interests was in just getting us to move away from those two poles towards that gray area a little bit more and actually start talking more explicitly about what was going on in it. I found it interesting exploring the relationship between climate change and orangutans. Climate change has some direct impacts, and there's also some more indirect stuff with deforestation and fragmentation leading to climate change and affecting orangutans. So I was curious, has climate change come up at all in your research or your experience? Do you have any thoughts about climate change as it pertains to orangutans? So one of the sort of big events of, I think it was 2015, was that there were these huge forest fires that were raging out of control across central Kalimantan and other parts of Indonesian Borneo. And I think it was estimated that that year, these forest fires, which were basically caused by mostly plantation fires, but also um, locally set fires for agriculture and other reasons, it was estimated that, that that year those fires actually emitted something like the equivalent amount of carbon to what you'd find emitted from the United States, for example, in an average year. So, you know, these were, these were big, big issues. And so I guess that in turn then feeds into this rather vicious cycle where deforestation is contributing to carbon emissions, specifically from Borneo, which in turn then has quite a significant impact on the availability of uh, both forests and and also food sources for orangutans. So I think one of the possible threats to orangutans is actually one of those knock-on effects of changing climates on the changing availability of plants and foods that they can actually survive on. So it's a bit sort of cyclical. And climate change hasn't been as high on the agenda as other, I guess, more direct causes like deforestation and and trafficking and stuff. But, you know, as you can see, it, it is very much sort of tied into all those different causes as well. 
The fact that orangutan conservation is so high profile was really interesting as well because orangutans are just one species in these very large and diverse ecosystems. So I imagine most of us don't want to see orangutans go extinct, but is there a reason why we focus so much of our energy on orangutans as opposed to looking at a broader ecosystem picture? Um, it depends on who you speak to. The sort of standard conservation argument is that, yes, orangutans are extremely special, first of all, because of their tremendous likeness to, to humans. So there's always this line, you know, that, that gets repeated about how orangutans share something like it's either 97 or 98 percent of their DNA with humans. And that that's pretty cool. I mean, there are all sorts of reasons why that, you know, that sort of kinship with humans makes great apes in general quite special. Conservationists also point out that orangutans are extremely important as seed dispersers. So they're sometimes styled as gardeners of the rainforest where, you know, they play a really important part of local um, ecosystems whereby they are responsible for helping to make sure that things are being spread and are growing healthily. Um, and again, that's quite a common argument uh, across biodiversity conservation, not just about orangutans. And finally, there's also a more kind of strategic argument in conservation about how, you know, as these iconic species that the world everybody in the world, well, most people in the world, maybe not people who actually live there, but most people in the world love and know um, orangutans uh, can actually play a very strategic role in helping to preserve entire ecosystem. But for the most part, and certainly what our research on the ground has been telling us, I just don't think people in Borneo would necessarily see orangutans as extra, extra special compared to any other kind of animal that they might encounter in, in, in their own environments. You know, you hear people talk about how orangutans are unusually like humans or how they're very cheeky or naughty or about how they're extra strong. But then they say all sorts of things about other animals as well, right? There are lots of different ways of describing the particular characteristics of other animals and the orangutan is just one of them. So I guess I'm a little bit more on the side of uh, local people in the sense that I think orangutans are really cool and they're really special and I'd hate to see them go extinct. But I can also see why um, from the view from the ground uh, could differ quite significantly to the view from conservation land. You started to talk about this, but in the Western areas of the world, we often think of orangutans as an animal that we as a globe are responsible for protecting. Whereas within a country like Malaysia or Indonesia, they might see it as a national responsibility. Whereas the people living in the forest uh, I guess it would be a local responsibility, but they also view the situation completely differently. So who exactly is responsible for orangutans here? And to whoever that group is, what would your advice be for them? I think there's sort of three main views on this, right? So that the kind of international conservation community, people in the global north will basically say, we as humans have a responsibility for orangutans who are fellow inhabitants of the planet. And therefore this gives us a right to do stuff. Uh, in the parts of the world where orangutans actually live. This can be quite damaging sometimes. National governments in Malaysia and Indonesia tend to portray the management of orangutan populations, their conservation as a national responsibility. So they acknowledge that the international community is very interested in them, but for them, you know, the buck stops with the national level, national policies, national conservation plans, national law. Then, of course, you then come to the kind of situation on the ground where you know, very often conflicts arise because conservation initiatives or orangutans are seen as encroaching onto or basically coming into people's customary lands. And they're basically saying, well, you know, th this, this is our stuff. Why did nobody ask us permission? What are these orangutans doing here? You know, when you release apes from rehabilitation centers and stuff. So the three very, very conflicting viewpoints. I, I think it's very difficult to say if, if one is more right than, than any of the others, because they're all valid in various ways. I think what's really crucial, though, is that that difference needs to be worked through. Up to now, a lot of orangutan conservation has really focused on trying to implement, you know, one particular program or one particular model of conservation 
on the areas where orangutans and humans basically live, have to share their space. And I think one of the biggest challenges facing orangutan conservation is, is how you can actually acknowledge the fact that there are these really quite significant differences, you know, philosophical, legal, customary differences in the way people see not only orangutans, but also the local environment and the space in which conservation is meant to be taking place. And to find ways of somehow um, respecting those differences, but finding ways of maybe achieving mutually beneficial outcomes. So one example very quickly is how some conservation organizations have found other animals that are of greater interest and importance to local communities in parts of Borneo, you know, for example, fish or wild pigs, and have actually seized on those as a way of engaging with local communities and shut up about orangutans, and just used those as bridges for bringing into existence new um, nature protection programs, or I guess not even nature protection programs, but just kind of uh, programs that could help um, ensure their sustainable coexistence. And, and by doing that, you, of course, benefit orangutans because you're helping to protect the forests in which they live and, you know, kind of encouraging local people to think a little bit more about what coexistence with non-human others might involve. So I guess that's one, you know, that's just one example of how conservationists on the ground are kind of working quite hard to overcome those issues. But it's it's a really, really difficult one because there's so many fundamentally different viewpoints and values at stake here. Dr. Chua, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. This wraps up episode 64 of The Sweaty Penguin. Remember, you can get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict. That helps boost us in their algorithms. You can also get a shout out by joining our Patreon. And you'll get not just a shout out, but merch, bonus content, even a chance to win a signed book from one of our experts. Head to patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin to unlock all that cool stuff and help grow the show. Once again, The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash peril and promise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week. Today's episode was written by Dane Kim, Ethan Brown, Shannon Dimiano, and Maddie Schmidt, fact-checked by Olivia Amate, and edited by Frank Hernandez. Our producers are Olivia Amate, Ethan Brown, Megan Crimmon, Shannon Dimiano, Frank Hernandez, Dane Kim, and Caroline Kale. Our ads were voiced by Lindsay Cronin, and our music was composed by Brett Saka. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownies Central. Clips today came from Smithsonian Channel, National Geographic, TEDx Talks, BBC News, and DW Documentary.